Theof... I don't know how to do this guy's name. It's spelled like Theophile, but I'm sure that's not how it is. Te Theophile? Theophile? So, let's talk about another popular romantic ballet, which, as I may have described before, does not mean lovey-dovey and romance-related, but actually just means has a plot. First performed in 1841 by the Ballet du, ballet du Théâtre de l'Académie Royale de Musique, in Paris, thanks French. In order to get what's going on with this story, we have to talk about this just absolute bonkers plot that they've put forward, and then see where the influences come from and what made it so instantly popular. Have you ever had a fiancé who's the daughter of a duke of a sizable portion of your homeland, but then you fall in love with a peasant girl, so you concoct a really insipid but also really stupid plan to try to have both of them? Then you must be the male protagonist of our story, Duke Albrecht. Albrecht, right, uh, betrothed to the daughter of a neighboring dukedom, who seems to still be, like, completely on good terms with his betrothed. And he comes into town one day to find that there's this shy, demure, sort of submissive-looking peasant girl named Giselle, who is both charming and beautiful and, conveniently, knows nothing about who Albrecht is and has never seen his face before. We run into the first problem because Albrecht is way too well-dressed to be just a normal peasant, and would be spotted and called out on his bullshit immediately if he tried to court Giselle while looking like a prince. So he packs his stuff up and goes home to wait for his marriage. Psych! Did you think that this would actually end up being like a, a decent person in the story? No, 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 no. Albrecht is garbage. No, of course, he's instead going to try to cook up a hilarious and complicated scheme. So he gets his squire, who is an accomplice in this whole thing and is just as guilty as Albrecht in the first place because of this thing right now, to get him some like crappy peasant clothes. And then he stashes his fancy garments, literally glittering jewel expensive sword and jeweled hunting horn somewhere, sets himself up so that he looks like this kind of poor peasant. Thing, so that he can try to undercover poor person the afternoon. And miraculously and conveniently to the story, it works. Like Clark Kent with a pair of glasses, nobody recognizes him in his poor people clothes, somehow, and he manages to convince Giselle to come out of her house and participate in the also plot convenient Harvest Festival that is going on right then. But plot twist, it turns out that Giselle has an unnamed cardiac disorder that makes her heart vaguely weak or something. Which is sad and ironic because Giselle loves to dance, and if she dances too much her heart will explode, disappear, turn into a baked potato, we don't know, and she'll die. And so her mother pops up and is like, no, Giselle, don't get swept off of your feet by this mysterious and ravishingly handsome stranger who looks nothing like the local duke, you'll dance too much. Enter now the rival love interest to Giselle, the gamekeeper Hilarion, who instantly distrusts this new handsome and clean peasant who has named himself Lois, a completely normal name I promise, and tried to make Giselle see that there's something suspicious and wrong about this, this whole situation, right? But Giselle is, however, so transfixed on Lois that she ignores his warnings and gets somewhat worked up with the dancing. But oh no, comedy of errors time! In comes a hunting party to the festival looking for food and drink and festivity like one would, and who should possibly be among this party but Albrecht's actual fiance, Bathilda. Of all the people who could have come to exactly where Al was trying to pull this hilarious ruse, the single person who would recognize his face and voice shows up. So this forces him to just bail on the festival completely and suddenly so that he doesn't get outed, since there has to be this sort of contrivance in a ballet performance, there are some plot unrelated showcase dances that go here. But Hilda actually meets Giselle, and the two of them get along phenomenally well. So well, in fact, that Bat Hilda gives Giselle like this really fancy necklace as like a parting gift before the hunting group shuffles off again. 
Now after the hunting party leaves, here comes Lois again, like Batman whenever Bruce Wayne has to disappear, and he dances again with Giselle. And to her delight, she is crowned the Harvest Queen, which is apparently important but largely plot irrelevant except to say that everyone really likes Giselle and she's really good at dancing, despite the whole heart thing. It is at this point, however, that it is proven that Albrecht is very much not as smooth as Batman, because Hilarion finds his poorly hidden stuff and exposes him as a nobleman by blowing the horn to call back the hunting party and showing off his glittery royal sword to the gathered crowd. Giselle sees that he's actually the duke, who the peasantry knows is set to marry another woman already, and she is heartbroken. But to make things worse, when Hilarion uses uses the hunting horn to call back that hunting party, they apparently weren't far enough away. So in comes Bathilda immediately. And like, okay, for just real quick, like, come on, my dude, if you're going to try to pull this sort of thing, at least wait until your actual real fiance has left and is far enough away that she's not going to like, oh, I forgot my gloves and come back or something like that. Come on, my dude. Elbrecht, you need to like take one class in villainous scheming, like just one. Wait until they're actually gone to try to put the moves on this other lady. But so he gets exposed and Giselle freaks out and completely loses her cool. And she knows now that she can never be with him, and flies into this kind of frenzy and dances harder and harder and harder until she collapses. And Hilarion turns on Albrecht and the two of them fight. But while they're fighting, Giselle manages to de life if I herself with Albrecht's sword, and Albrecht flees in abject misery while Giselle's mother mourns at the loss of her ambiguously weak-hearted daughter and the curtain falls. But that's just act one, baby. There's a whole other act coming up. If you thought act one was bonkers unbelievable, get ready to have your bar lowered even further because now there's ghosts involved. Act two starts cut to a grave in a forest late at night where we find Hilarion mourning for his lost love. The forest is technically not part of like the church's grounds, but that's where Giselle has been buried because since she committed self-unalivement, she wasn't permitted to be buried in hollowed ground because it's the one unforgivable sin. And this becomes a problem when the wheelie show up. Characters in this shared universe of a lot of the romantic ballets who are the ghosts of women who died from broken hearts, or at least complications related thereto. Hilarion, seeing this roaming band of man-torturing ghosts turn up, does the smart thing and gets himself the hell out of there, and some wheelie chase after him. But the leader of the wheelie, Myrta, somehow has the power to raise the ghost of the recently dead Giselle and induct her into the wheelie gang? I guess? She disappears into the forest, and Giselle goes with her, and they leave the grave ghostless. Conveniently, this is also when Albrecht, the cowardly traitor and cheater, also appears to mourn. Giselle's ghost comes back, and they have this tender but wholly undeserved and unjustified moment of forgiveness, and then she leaves to go back to her new street gang of murderous ghosts. Albrecht, of course, unwisely tries to follow her into the deep and treacherous forest, and it's here that we come across the gang forcing Hilarion to dance until he dies. Because ballet, main weapon is dancing. Have it no other way. They use their magic to make him do an actually, like, really cool variation that if you have a chance you should YouTube the thing that he does right now. But anyway, it drains him all of his energy and then they drown him in the lake. So Larian dead. His death was unjustified, but that's how the wheelie do. However, Albrecht's possible death would at least have actual betrayal attached to it, so it's not surprising when the ghost gang turns on him and starts to cast Otto's Irresistible Dance on him as well. He fails his wisdom save several times in a row and is forced to dance until the sun comes up. Fortunately, as a noble, he actually has training in dancing with like court dances and that kind of business. And as such, he's able to keep his stamina up for a little longer than his rival Hilarion actually could. And Giselle tries during this time to have Myrta spare his life, but the wheelie gang boss refuses, of course. And even with his noble stamina, Albrecht nearly dies. Except, surprise, while Giselle might be a ghost, she's technically never 
actually joined the wheelie gang, and she uses her different and completely also unexplained love-based ghost magic to make sure that Albrecht lives until the first rays of the sun, whereupon the other ghosts have to return to their graves. Albrecht is saved by the again unwarranted and undeserved love and forgiveness of Giselle's ghost, who sinks back into her grave and stops being a ghost anymore. The end. Actual curtain comes down, end of thing, everyone does their bows. There's a lot to unpack here, as there always is with these ridiculous plotted ballets, but let's go into some background first. In 1832, nine years earlier, there was a two-act romantic ballet about a guy who falls in love with a different girl when he's set to be married to another one, where there's supernatural forces and a strong but evil female influencing the events, and where the lead female dies in the lead male's arms, much to the chagrin of the male romantic rival. The story may be different, but there's enough of a through line between Giselle and the earlier and also incredibly famous La Sylphide, which is distinct from Les Sylphide, which is another thing completely, which we can talk about at some point, I'm sure. But the group of ghostly fairy lady sylphs in La Sylphide was an inspiration for the wheelie and Giselle, in addition to a few other direct references in theme and setting, parallels there. And then the writer of the ballet, Théophile Gautier, TA. Uh, basically put two separate pieces from disparate backgrounds together to make this story, and took the aesthetics from La Sylphide and another short ballet about promiscuous ghost nuns trying to make a knight take a cursed talisman. So it also helps that Giselle was a reintroduction for the incredible ballerina Carlotta Grisi, who danced and sang before throughout Europe in ballets and operas and that kind of business, but who really started to shine when she got the role of Giselle in the first staging. And this ballet alone, with its intense variations and in solos, as well as intricate partner work, and the necessity for work on point as a part of the aesthetic of the production, and not just as like an acrobatic stunt like it has been before that, catapulted her into the starlight, and had her join the ranks of the other stars of the Romantic era, like Fanny Essler, Fanny Cerrito, there's a bunch of Fannies in classical ballet, who knows why, and Marie Taglioni. If you're a ballet aficionado, or even just a casual fan of ballet, there is a humongous chance that you have at least heard of this production. It is an incredibly popular story, and basically every classical ballet company does it once at least every couple of years. There are several questions raised, though, and they aren't ever really addressed. For instance, what the hell happens with Bathilda? Like, she knows about this whole thing. We don't hear from her again after Act 1 is finished. Does she does she eventually still get married to Albrecht? Does she ditch his ass like she should? I mean, we don't know. It could be that this is like a political marriage that is arranged by their parents, and so that's gotta happen no matter what anyway, at which point Bat Hilda would be very justified in like taking a different lover or something. And then whenever Albrecht says something about it, she'd be like, hey, do you remember that one peasant girl? Shut your mouth. All we have on her at all is that she was fond of Giselle. So does she end up going to her grave sometimes too to just have like heart to heart girl talks just be like hey you know i uh i remember how my husband was trying to uh trying to get into your pants as well i wish you would stop trying to get into mine or something like that right like technically she also had an unfaithful lover so when she dies does she eventually also become part of the wheelie gang as well we have a lot of unknown information on such an important story character right but then also albrecht himself was his plan to run out on Bathilda, who is, by the way, the daughter of a duke, and instead marry this peasant girl that would also probably completely exile him from his family because why would you be marrying the peasant girl? You can't possibly mean to, you know, share your, your inheritance and wealth and all that with that, but whatever. But like, was his plan to run out on Bathilda, or was his plan just to romance and then one time bang Giselle and then disappear and go back to the dukely life? Was he intending to try to like live a double life and keep both lives? ladies at the same time, like, you know, the, the stupid movies where a guy is in a diner on two different dates and has to, like, run into the bathroom, put on a different shirt, and go sit with the other girl for a little bit before he runs back and puts on the first shirt or whatever. Just, like, what is his incredibly stupid plan supposed to achieve? And furthermore, does nobody know about the murderous, jilted lover ghosts in the forest? Like, this has to be a thing. 
surely people know about it, right? So you'd think that maybe people would try to avoid invoking them, or running into them, or I don't know, even maybe creating more of them. I would like to know more about the Wheelie Queen, though. She seems like a D&D mid-boss villain, like a mix between like a wraith and a siren, maybe? And her magic is necromantic in nature because of the whole raising the ghost thing, but she also definitely has Otto's irresistible dance in her abilities, and can grant the other ghosts the same abilities. Might be an interesting encounter to have a party run into a group of the Wheelie and their commander, the Wheelie Queen. Anyway, um, that's Giselle sort of picked apart a little bit. I know I said I was going to do other ballets first, but Giselle is too fun of a story not to jump the line. And also, uh, I actually wanted to talk about this one. So thank you guys very much for watching. You can click the like and subscribe buttons if you have not already done so. It would be rad if you did. And if you haven't done it yet, what are you doing, man? I'm just a little guy, you just gotta push the buttons and then it'll be better for me. Thank you guys again very much for coming and watching. I will see you next time.